Good evening, I'm Jake Ward in for Gotti Schwartz. We begin tonight with breaking news. Hamas has released two more hostages who were taken during that brutal massacre more than two weeks ago. They are both Israeli women, 85-year-old Yosheved Lifshitz and 79-year-old Nurit Cooper. Israeli officials say both women were abducted with their husbands, and those two men remain captives of Hamas. Video broadcast on Egyptian state television shows the women there being taken out of ambulances by staff members of the Red Cross. This appears to have been uh, near the Rafah crossing along Gaza's border with Egypt. The military wing of Hamas says both women were released for, quote, compelling humanitarian reasons. Their release comes three days after Hamas freed two Americans who were being held hostage. The Israeli military has told families that over 200 people were kidnapped on October 7th. The U.S. State Department has said that 10 of those hostages are American. We, uh, we have no higher, higher priority than the safety of Americans that are being held around the world, and we're going to continue around the clock to see if we can get them home with their families, where they belong. It is literally an hour-by-hour hour effort here at the White House and at the State Department to find out where these folks are and to try to make this, uh, the, the effort to, to get them out and get them back. Now, U.S. officials tell NBC News that in an attempt to buy more time to negotiate the release of those hostages, the Biden administration is now advising Israel to delay a ground invasion into Gaza. Over the weekend and again today, humanitarian aid continued to make its way into Gaza through the Rafah crossing from Egypt. But according to a State Department spokesperson, so far, several hundred American citizens in Gaza have been blocked by Hamas from leaving. Meanwhile, the Israeli army says it has increased airstrikes on Hamas military targets in that area just in the last 24 hours. NBC's news correspondent Ellison Barber is on the Israeli-Gaza border, and she joins us now. Ellison, thanks for being here. What do we know about these two women, their condition, and whether they've seen their families yet? Yeah, so when they crossed from Gaza via the Rafah border crossing into Egyptian territory, we saw via images that were uh, streamed, posted, taken, and shown on Egyptian TV, we saw both women getting into an ambulance, being placed into an ambulance, one of them waving at the cameras. They appeared to be in relatively good condition given what they have been through. But the IDF says that they are now taking Israeli military members, and forgive me for glancing behind us as we're keeping an eye on the border with Gaza there. But, Jake, uh, the IDF says that after they were taken across the border into Egypt, that they were then put into the custody of IDF military members, and they were, last we heard, making their way to a medical center inside of Israel for further treatment. Uh, one thing to keep in mind here, we're talking about a 79-year-old and an 85-year-old. According to Israeli officials, both of their husbands, who are in their 80s, are still being held inside of Gaza right now. So far, we have seen four hostages released. The first two, American Israeli citizens. These two, Cooper and Lifshitz, they are both Israeli citizens now being released, soon to be checked on at a medical center here in Israel. But so far, we haven't gotten an update beyond that. Israel has thanked both the Red Cross, as well as Egyptian officials for their role in this. We understand that Egypt acted as the primary mediator in securing their release. The last wave, uh, the last two hostages we saw released, the Qatari government had acted as the primary mediator in that. Jake? Ellison, I want to play part of an interview NBC News chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel did with an official from Hamas about the possibility of more hostages possibly being released. Watch. Trust needs to be established. Will Hamas release more prisoners to build trust? Now, Ellison, Hamas obviously took these hostages for tactical reasons. Do you get the sense that they're getting anything in return from these releases that we've seen, both the two before and the two we're talking about tonight? In terms of some sort of clear physical trade, no. I mean, there, at the beginning of all of this, Hamas was asking for the upwards of 4,000 Palestinian prisoners in 
Israeli custody to be released. As far as we know, there has not been any sort of change where Israel has released any of the Palestinians they have in Israeli prisons in exchange for the release of these hostages. Hamas has said that they are releasing and have released them all four for humanitarian reasons. When the first two American Israeli uh, citizens were released. Hamas said they did this for humanitarian reasons and also to show the American public that what President Biden and what they described as his fascist government were saying about Hamas was not true. With these two, they said they made the decision to release them for humanitarian purposes as well as medical reasons. Israel, they say this is all propaganda, that Hamas is trying to present an image as if they are some sort of humanitarian stewards when really they still have over 220 at least people held inside of Gaza. And they say this is purely propaganda. There's some thought that possibly this is being done to try and delay that looming ground offensive into Gaza. But Israel hasn't said that directly, neither has Hamas. But in terms of any sort of tangible, they got this for this, that hasn't happened here. Jake. Mm. And Ellison, you are there on the border and I can sense that you're having to be tremendously vigilant just around you moment by moment. Are you getting any sense of uh, the possibility of a ground invasion, any movements of troops at the border. What are you seeing there? You know, we've heard tanks firing in the direction of Gaza. We've heard what sounded like some sort of machine guns in a city, uh, Ashkelon, that's kind of further down that way, uh, but heard it echoing through. And that's kind of the best way to describe the area that's further down uh, from where we are, where you would maybe hear something like that. But look, there's an obvious presence of Israeli troops in this area. They have checkpoints set up all around this area. As we have been on the border for almost more than two weeks now, we have seen this constant presence, this constant buildup of Israeli forces, as well as Israeli military equipment, be that tanks, be that uh, other armed personnel carriers, be that ammunition coming in on flatbeds. And for quite a few days now, it seemed like the movement of military equipment towards the Gaza border has stopped because it seems like all of it is there. At one point, we saw tanks getting into a formation in a field area, but that ground offensive it has not started yet. There was one IDF troop we spoke to in this area last night, and they had told us that last night they had told, been told by friends along the border that they had gotten the warning, the order that the ground assault was going to happen last night. And they'd even taken their cell phones telling them that it was going to happen. But then it didn't happen. And when we were talking to them, they had said that was the third time they'd gotten orders saying that the ground assault into Gaza was going to take place and then those orders were reversed or they just simply didn't happen. Another decision was made. We have seen repeatedly top Israeli officials from Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to Israel's defense minister going to visit troops along the border and telling them that this next phase of the war will begin soon. We heard more language of that uh, tonight from one of the chief generals within the Israeli Air Force saying that they are ready for this next phase. But right now it is still just this waiting game. And there's this kind of mixed feeling at times amongst the Israeli public. A lot of people we have spoken to since the very beginning of this have been adamant in wanting to see a ground invasion into Gaza. But we have also seen families of people being held hostage inside of Gaza protesting in Tel Aviv outside of Israeli military headquarters saying that they want more to be done to bring the hostages home and that they don't want to see a ground offensive until hostages are brought home because Look, there are some, by a lot of estimates, 300 miles of tunnels mm. underneath Gaza that have been constructed by Hamas. It's believed that those hostages are deep inside of those tunnels. And if there's a ground assault, there's a potential risk for loss of life from the Israeli side in terms of hostages, civilian hostages being held inside of there. So there are all these different factors at play. But for now, everything seems to be in place for a ground offensive to start as soon as the decision is made. But that decision hasn't been made just yet. Jake. Ellison Barber keeping moment by moment track of it for us. Ellison, thank you so much.
Now, as we just mentioned, some aid has made its way into Gaza through the Rafah border crossing. The first trucks went in on Saturday, and 20 more went in earlier today. According to the United Nations, a total of 54 aid trucks have been delivered to Gaza so far. All of that for a population of over 2 million people who've been running out of food, medicine, water, and fuel for over two weeks now. And Israel is still not allowing fuel deliveries, which the U.N. is saying can grind their humanitarian mission to a halt. Here's an example of it. Hospitals inside Gaza need fuel as they struggle to keep generators running during a full electricity blackout. The domino effects here are clear. Mind you, Gaza has always been heavily dependent on this kind of aid, since Israel and Egypt have enforced tight restrictions on movement and access of goods in and out of Gaza. UN officials say Gaza's daily average of supplies used to be around 500 trucks a day, and before the war, an average of 10,000 truckloads of goods entered Gaza every month. Let's bring in NBC News correspondent Hala Garani from Tel Aviv. Hala, this is the first time aid is going into Gaza since October 7th. Gaza has always been dependent on aid, but give us a sense of the scale of this. I mean, are these 54 trucks going to make any dent in the needs of the people there? No, and you, and you laid it out uh, very well. Uh, on any given day before the war, 400, 500 trucks would go in. Uh, Gaza could be supplied with fuel. Hospitals are saying that they're soon going to be able to, uh, unable to treat uh, people because they don't have fuel for generators to power the machines, to power the life support machines, the incubators that are needed to keep people uh, who are in uh, need of some of this equipment alive. Uh, and uh, Israel has been very clear. It will not allow fuel in because it says that it would be diverted potentially by Hamas inside of the Gaza Strip. Regardless, though, the number of water bottles, the little bit of medicine, and the uh, basic essentials that are being sent in uh, are really, uh, the shipments do not even come close to meeting the absolutely immense need of more than two million people who've been suffering really under bombardments for more than two weeks now. And it's not just people living in their homes. These are people living in tents, a lot of them. Uh, the uh, Gazans in the northern part of the Strip were warned several days ago by the Israeli military that dropped leaflets on them saying that they needed to move south, that if they stayed in the northern part of the Gaza Strip, they put their lives and the lives of their families at risk. And so, therefore, they have nowhere really to go except to live in tents or live outdoors or live in buildings that are unsafe. And so, therefore, their needs are not the needs needs of people who live in ordinary housing, and those needs as well are not being met. So really the humanitarian situation, uh, aid agencies will tell you, including the UN, uh, is dire, and it's going to get, only going to get worse. In fact, you, you mentioned the lack of fuel. The UN uh, Relief and Works Agency, which uh, takes care of uh, and oversees the refugees inside of the Gaza Strip, has said essentially uh, fuel is as urgent as water water at this stage. Back to you. Hala, we, we're looking here at live footage. We will put it back up here of, of just uh, two things strike me about it. First of all, we are seeing, as you were speaking, occasional flashes of, of explosives uh, going off, um, presumably uh, airstrikes and the attacks connected to them, the horror of that. But second is the darkness that I see of that landscape. There is absolutely, uh, there's almost no light to be seen whatsoever. I wonder if you could just contextualize for us, you on the ground, you know, for those of us who enjoy the comforts of a centralized infrastructure with reliable electricity where we do not have to think about fuel except putting it into our vehicles give us some sense of the importance of fuel to a, a household in Gaza what does fuel represent both to families and to institutions in in that region so you might remember that uh, immediately after the October 7th, uh, the horrific October 7th attacks, the uh, defense minister of Israel announced a total siege on Gaza. No water, no electricity. Uh, and so therefore, uh, without fuel, Gazans cannot power generators. So because they are off the grid and they cannot enjoy the fuel, uh, the, electri uh, the electricity supply, I should say, from Israel, fuel is really all they have to power those 
those generators, and that's why you're seeing a completely dark skyline over uh, Gaza. But fuel isn't just used to power generators in hospitals. Even if the taps are turned back on for water, what uh, experts tell us uh, is that water plants need fuel in order to then um, redistribute water to the um, residents and, and buildings left standing across the Gaza Strip. So uh, electricity and, and fuel and all of those basic utilities kind of work in, in, in a way that is combined to provide essential services to the people of Gaza. And that is all on hold right now, especially considering that so many of the buildings that were standing just two weeks ago have become piles of rubble. So it's a, it's a very, very difficult and dire humanitarian situation now for the people of the Gaza Strip. Just uh, so shocking to see this live footage of Gaza under both bombardment and a total lack of fuel, which, as you have explained so well here, is so critical to a household's survival. Halagrani, thank you so much for being with us. Mm -hmm. Every day that this war goes on, there is the risk of it expanding into a wider conflict across the Middle East. Lebanon and Syria are already involved with the fighting. Egypt has the only direct border with Gaza besides Israel. And the United States has deployed ships to parts of the Mediterranean Sea. Now, today, NBC News has confirmed an attempted drone attack at an American base in Syria. Other bases in Syria and Iraq have also been targeted in recent weeks. Thousands of troops are in both of those countries right now. So the question is, who is behind these new attacks? Fresh reporting tonight from NBC's Courtney Cuby, quoting a senior U.S. defense official that there are Iranian fingerprints all over it, end quote. NBC's bureau chief and correspondent Ali Arouzi is in Tehran for us. Ali, tell us, what is Iran saying about these attempted a attacks on American bases? Well, th this is clearly a, a message from Iran through its proxies uh, for America not to be involved in the conflict in Israel and not to have its eyes on any sort of military conduct on Iran. And this is Iran's MO. They use these proxies to send messages out when they feel the heat. And they have a lot of these proxies in the region. They're very well equipped by Iran and they can be very effective. Uh, as you mentioned, they have a lot of them in Syria, in Iraq. Uh, that's their terrain. They know how to navigate the place. They can conduct uh, quick, sharp operations, either using you know, their weapons or drones uh, to hurt U.S. facilities. And that's a message from Iran to say, steer clear of us and steer clear of, of Gaza. And they have their proxies to do that. They don't, when Iran is, uh, is directly confronted with this, they use plausible deniability. They said, yes, 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 mm. we, we, we protect all of these uh, proxies, we fund them, but what they do has nothing to do with us. Clearly, it does have something to do with them, and these sort of attacks always bear the hallmarks of Iranian planning or Iranian direction. And Ali, you know, for those of us who do not follow this as, as well as you do, you look at a map of the region and there are, all, of course, all the different names of the different nations around it, which makes uh, perhaps a Western audience think, ah, these are different, company, different countries separate from Iran, disconnected from Iran. But of course, Iran has this network of influence. So, so help us understand that. Remind us which countries and organizations Iran have been known to act through and why that's so important in this moment between Israel and Gaza? Uh, so, Jake, over the last few decades, Iran has built, trained, equipped, and spent a vast fortune on proxy groups that are under their patronage in, in, in order to, to build an axis of resistance, that's what they call it, uh, to improve the combat efficiencies of all of their proxies. And their proxies are Hezbollah in Lebanon, obviously Hamas in Gaza, militants in Iraq, militants in Syria, and not just militants in Syria, they have the backing of of the Syrian government and a little further afield, the Houthis in, in Yemen. So this makes quite a formidable force of militias in the region that have all been trained by Iran, they've been equipped by Iran, they get funding by Iran, uh, and ultimately they answer to Iran. What Iran wants uh, from them, they do. And one of the reasons Iran has done this, has created this assortment of, of militias in the region, 
is a to poke a finger at Israel. Uh, Iran has always stated that its objective is the destruction of Israel. So they use these proxies to hurt Israel. And just as importantly, they use these proxies so the fight doesn't come onto Iranian soil. So they keep the fight away from I Iran. Interestingly, Jake, as soon as uh, Hamas uh, conducted this horrifying attack on October the 7th, Almost a day later, the Iranians put up a big poster in one of their main squares saying the fight is in Tel Aviv, not in Tehran. And that's a clear message to saying that they've taken the fight to Israel, but there's nothing happening on their own soil. And these proxies have now really become a force to reckon with. They're very strong. They've got big numbers and they're very well armed by Iran. Ali Aruzi, with such important context for us uh, and up late tonight in Tehran. Ali, thank you so much. All that as intense clashes continue on the Israeli-Lebanon border. The U.S. Embassy in Beirut now issuing another warning to Americans in Lebanon. In short, it's get out while you can. NBC's Matt Bradley has more from the border. Well, it's another day of fierce fighting here along the Lebanese-Israeli border. We heard from Hezbollah that at least one Hezbollah fighter was killed, bringing the total number of casualties since this latest crisis began to 28 Hezbollah dead. And now we also heard that on the Israeli side, at least two Israelis were wounded. Now, in terms of casualty numbers, this isn't the most we've seen in the last more than two weeks, but we're still seeing a huge uptick in the fighting. And this is because, well, if you zoom out and examine it from the broader region, we've seen a lot of tension increasing. And in fact, just in the past couple of hours, we heard that there were strikes against U.S. military installations in southern Syria. And again, this is part of a continuum that we've been seeing, where not just fighting focused here on the border between Israel and Lebanon, but between Iran's axis of resistance, and those are that loose coalition of militant groups like Hezbollah and Hamas and the Gaza Strip, along with Bashar al-Assad Syria, Houthi rebels fighting in Yemen, and even militant groups in Iraq that are backed by Iran. This creates this patchwork of alliances throughout the Middle East, part of which are at least somewhat beholden to Tehran. And a lot of those groups are waiting, finally, for some kind of signal from Iran. And that's probably not going to come from our understanding, our discussions with people who are close to or somehow part of Hezbollah. They say that they're probably going to be waiting to see what Israel does next in the Gaza Strip. That is the next shoe to drop. That's what the entire region is waiting for. And here in southern Lebanon, folks are waiting as well, because this country is re weary of war. It's now in the fifth year of a long economic crisis, and it remembers back to 2006, everybody here, to that devastating fighting. So people here don't want to see Hezbollah drag them into another war, despite the fact that there's quite a bit of solidarity for the Palestinian people. Matt Bradley for us tonight. Matt, thank you so much. There is much more ahead for you this hour. Here in the U.S., a synagogue leader was fatally stabbed, but police are saying the killing was not motivated by anti-Semitism. We'll ask them, how are they so sure? Plus, an off-duty commercial pilot was just charged with over 80 counts of attempted murder, and the incident happened mid-flight. That is all just ahead. Please stay tuned. Welcome back. Tonight, a community is grieving the loss of their synagogue president after she was brutally murdered over the weekend. Police say there are multiple persons of interest in the case, but they stopped short of calling anyone a suspect. We are working through um, what we have identified are some persons of interest, uh, and we're very confident on the track that we're on. Um, but we're early. We're very, very early in this investigation. Police found Samantha Wool's body on Saturday morning outside her home. The 40-year-old synagogue president led the congregation of Isaac Agree in downtown Detroit. And despite her role in the community and the timing of it all, police say right now they do not believe this was a hate crime. NBC's Jesse Kirsch joins us now from Detroit. Jesse, given who the victim is here and the timing of it all, how are the authorities so certain that this was not a hate crime? 
Yeah, so what I can tell you, Jake, is that authorities are sharing some information very explicitly saying they're not going to go further at this point, saying that there is some information out there that authorities believe just a suspect would know. So uh, there are only certain things that police are discussing, and they have not publicly shared any motive with us. But what they say is they do not believe anyone else is at risk in connection with this incident. Here's part of what police said about questions surrounding this case and the possibility of if this could have been fueled by anti-Semitism. We believe that the motivation is very different uh, uh, than a hate crime. Um, it's horrific and it's tragic. Uh, and, and that's the focus of, of it, the investigation. But if something uh, leads us down that path again or if something comes up, uh, we will certainly uh, be engaging our federal partners and, and looking at that. And another thing I want to bring up, Jake, I talked with a police official after the press conference as well, and they told me that even if events that are going on in the world right now were not transpiring, pretend that the Israel-Hamas war were not unfolding right now, the police department said that they would still be putting out word if and when they believe that there was no connection to anti-Semitism as far as a motive goes, because we're talking about someone who was actively, publicly, and prominently part of a faith organization, Jake. And Jesse, I just can't quite imagine how the community is reacting to this uh, idea. I, I, you know, ruling out a hate crime, does that somehow bring them any relief? Is that the sense you get, or does it just destabilize them further? Yeah, I, at this point, this is being seen, at least by some, as a senseless loss of life. I spoke with the rabbi here at the downtown Detroit synagogue where Samantha Wall was the president, and the rabbi told me that Samantha Wall was someone who listened, and the rabbi was just one of multiple people we've heard from that talked about Samantha Wall being someone who wanted to bridge divides, bring people together, bring people from different communities together, and I think that just makes this loss all the more heartbreaking at what is such a tough time in this country and around the world, Jake. Jesse Kirsch for us in Detroit tonight. Jesse, thank you. Coming up, a terrifying incident 30,000 feet in the air. An off-duty pilot tried to kill the engines on a commercial flight. Those details are next. Welcome back. Here are some of the other headlines we're watching tonight. A college student has died after drinking Panera Bread's charged lemonade, and now her family is suing. Her name was Sarah Katz. She was 21 years old. The suit argues that Panera failed to appropriately warn customers about the new drink's ingredients, which contains more caffeine than cans of Red Bull and Monster Energy drink combined, according to the suit. Katz had a heart condition and drank a charged lemonade last September. Hours later, she went into cardiac arrest. It's day four in the search for a man suspected of killing a Maryland judge. Authorities say they believe he is no longer in the immediate area. Judge Andrew Wilkinson was shot by Pedro Argote hours after awarding his ex-wife custody of their children. Michigan State University apologized for showing an image of Adolf Hitler on its scoreboard before a football game Saturday night. The photo of Hitler and the name of his birthplace, Austria, were shown as part of a pregame quiz. A university official said an unnamed employee connected to the incident has been suspended and an investigation is underway. The United Auto Workers strike has expanded as nearly 7,000 people stopped working at a plant that makes Ram 1500 trucks, one of its most profitable vehicles. The move comes after UAW President Sean Fain criticized Stellantis for proposing contracts which he says were weaker than those offered by Ford and General Motors. And Louisiana, Louisiana officials say seven people are dead and dozens more have been hurt after a pileup involving over 100 cars. The National Weather Service says an intense combination of smoke and fog, known as super fog, is responsible for the low visibility, which likely caused a deadly chain reaction. First responders continue to search for more victims. Happening right now, Republicans are huddled behind closed doors holding a candidate forum for Speaker of the House. In total, nine men, they're all men, have thrown their hat in the ring to take on the role. But after both Congressman Steve Scalise and Jim Jordan failed to secure the 217 votes needed, 
We're all wondering, can anyone get there? It is very much up in the air, and the mood in the Republican Party is pretty tense as a result. California Republican Congressman Tom McClintock wrote a scathing letter to his eight colleagues that voted to oust former House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. He suggested that his, quote, wayward colleagues have seen, uh, sorry, excuse me, have the wisdom to see the damage they have done to our country and to have the courage to set things right before it's too late. And over the weekend, several members of the House GOP did not hesitate to vent their frustrations either. This is not a time to play games. This is, a, this is embarrassing for the Republican Party. It's embarrassing for the nation. Our conference is broken. We owe the American people an apology. We cannot have an entire branch of government offline. Yeah, it's my 10th term in Congress. Yeah. This is probably one of the most embarrassing uh, things I've seen. Do you guys have any idea how clownish you look? Well, you know, Jake, I'm, I'm very fond of saying that um, Congress is a light like high school, but even more so. NBC senior Capitol Hill correspondent Garrett Hake joins me now. Garrett, how is it looking? Of those nine candidates, is there anything like a frontrunner yet? Well, Jacob, at least one of those candidates has decided he's not going to get there. Dan Muser dropped out about halfway through this candidate forum tonight. So I suppose we've made some progress in the sense that we know one person who won't be the next Speaker of the House. But look, I think coming into tonight, there were probably two candidates who I'm watching most closely. One of them is Tom Emmer. He's the current whip. That's the number three person in House Republican leadership. He's won leadership elections before. He has a big team. He has people who owe him favors, which are all important things. Uh, when when you go into a leadership election like this, but he also has enemies, and that might be a problem. He is not particularly popular with the Donald Trump wing of the party. The other person I'm watching is Byron Donalds, who is popular in that Trump wing of the party. He's relatively new. This is his second term, and he's got, I think, what might be a good combination of sort of charisma and likability within the party, but none of that kind of deep-seated dislike of somebody who's been up here long enough to have hurt some feelings in the course of his career. They're probably the two who I'm watching the most closely tonight, but uh, I think if the last three weeks have taught us anything, it's that we don't really know anything until the votes start getting counted on the floor. Garrett, it's been, you know, about, what is it, 20 days without a speaker. And of course, we're at a moment where we need government to, uh, you know, perhaps take up uh, war funding on behalf of the Biden administration or keep the government running. But remind mm -hmm. us of the other kinds of business that this government has to move forward. What is suffering as this fight for speaker goes on? Well, look, those are probably the two most pressing needs you just outlined. The fact that funding for the entire government runs out in a couple of weeks. Congress has made no progress on addressing that. Uh, this funding package that the Biden administration has requested for hotspots around the world, that includes money for Israel, for Ukraine, for Taiwan, and for the U.S. border. None of that money is getting anywhere. But there are other programs that are set to expire over the next couple of months or who have recently expired. Things like some pandemic-era child care uh, programs that could use additional funding. There's making sure that disaster funding is there and available for Americans who need it. I mean, really anything in which federal dollars are doled out is particularly frozen. I mean, the Senate can still confirm ambassadors and judges and all that kind of thing. But anything that requires that chamber behind me to open and get work done is totally frozen. And the work just backs up and backs up and backs up towards the end of the year. So, Garrett, I mean, I, I want to just ask you, you know, what happens next? But in fairness to you, I also want to ask, have we entered a phase that is so detached from precedent that it is impossible to answer that question? Are we beyond knowing what could possibly happen next? Yeah, look, I mean, I think we're in a position where knowing the specifics is very hard, although the general contours are, are going to remain the same, right? It's such a narrow majority that really only two things can happen. Some Republican is going to shoot the moon here and manage to land the, land the majority in this very narrow place where he, or possibly she, if it's not any of these eight men still in it, um, have the right combination of enough friends, enough frustration, and few enough enemies that they can be elected in a traditional way. Or we're going to see something truly unusual, which is if enough dysfunction builds up, perhaps another week or more, you'll see a bipartisan coalition select somebody to be the speaker. That somebody will almost certainly be a Republican, but they'll be, they'll be running the show with some Democratic votes. And that would be truly unprecedented in this body, Jake. NBC's Garrett Haake on the shoot the moon beat for us. Garrett, thank you so much. You bet. 
Pilots on a flight had to make an emergency landing in Portland yesterday after an off-duty pilot allegedly tried to turn off the plane's engine in the middle of the flight. A Horizon Airlines plane, which is a subsidiary of Alaskan Airlines, took off from Everett, Washington around 5.30 p.m. heading for San Francisco. You can see it following its typical track there, and then it makes a detour. Less than an hour into that flight, that off-duty Alaskan Airlines pilot who was sitting in the cockpit's jump seat tried to shut off the engine. He failed thanks to the pilot and first officer, and shortly after that happened, the pilots alerted air traffic control. Have a listen. Give you a heads up. We've got the uh, guy that tried to shut the engines down uh, out of the cockpit, um, and he uh, doesn't sound like he's causing any issue in the back right now. I, I think he's the dude. Other than that, uh, yeah, we want law enforcement as soon as we get on the ground and park. That off-duty pilot is now in custody. He was booked on 83 counts of grade A attempted murder. NBC's Ken Delanian joins us now. Ken, how on earth does this happen? I mean, paint a picture for us. Where was this guy sitting? What is a jump seat and how close was he to the controls? Well, Jake, we're told it's a seat inside the cockpit obviously reserved for trusted members of the airline, which this man apparently was. He's an off-duty pilot for Alaska Airlines, so he was trusted to sit in the cockpit. And what they're telling us is that he started to try to disable the engine by activating a fire suppression device. And the pilot and the co-pilot had to essentially wrestle him down. And they subdued him, and they were able to divert the flight and make an unscheduled landing and get the passengers off on their way. And as you said, he's been arrested. He's in jail, uh, booked on 83 counts of attempted murder, but just a really disquieting and, if not terrifying, thing to have happened in the skies. And there's still a lot of questions about uh, exactly what happened, exactly who this person was and why he did it, Jake. It, Ken, you know, pilots are, are one of the highest security civilian jobs around. They are vetted and trained for years. Just listening to the audio from the cockpit to ground control, uh, in which they are very calmly describing the scariest thing you could imagine, you know, it all mm. just reminds you, right, they go through so much training to get into that position. What do we know about this pilot? Do we know anything about a motive? Is there any clue as to how he could have gone through all of that and still wound up attempting to do this? So here's what we know. His name is Joseph Emerson. Um, he is reportedly living with his family in Northern California, 44 years old. Neighbors have given interviews saying he was a pleasant person and a quiet, uh, unobtrusive person. So what does that tell us? Pretty much nothing. But authorities mm -hmm. are saying that this is not connected to terrorism or recent events in Israel, which is something that came to mind when many of us heard about this. So they're not saying exactly what the motive may have been or whether they even know or whether he's talking. They're just saying it wasn't terrorism. Jake. And Horizon obviously is a subsidiary of Alaska Airlines. Alaska Airlines is a major American airline. At last count, it was the fifth largest in the country. Do you think they will take any sort of commercial hit from this? It's unclear, but they haven't really said much by way of explanation, other than that they are cooperating with authorities. Uh, and the FBI is among the agencies that are investigating. So a lot of questions remain to be answered, um, but it does seem like one of those freak occurrences, Jake. Ken Delanian with a very alarming story. Thank you so much for being here. Now, Democratic Senator Bob Menendez was back in federal court this afternoon pleading not guilty to his latest charges. He is accused of accepting bribes and acting as a foreign agent on behalf of the Egyptian government. Leaving the courthouse today, he once again denied any wrongdoing, but this time in Spanish. Somos inocentes y lo vamos a comprobar. Those proclamations of innocence in any language have not won him the confidence of his constituents or colleagues. According to a new poll out from Farley Dickinson University, a whopping 70 percent of New Jersey residents say they want him to resign. That's in addition to more than 30 of his fellow Democrats in the Senate. Joining us now is NBC News legal analyst Denny Savalo, so we can understand a little bit about what's facing the senator here. Uh, Denny, this arraignment was for the indictment on October 12th, but he also pled not guilty to charges last month. Remind us what he's facing. Break down the charges for us. The most recent charge is for a FARA violation, a Foreign Agent Registration Act. These charges are almost never brought, maybe a handful in the history of the statute. And it's been around uh, for about a century. So uh, this is a rarely brought statute. And Menendez is charged actually technically under a separate section because he's a government official. In theory, he couldn't register under FARA because he's not allowed to be a foreign agent because, guess what? 
he's a member of Congress, and that's why he can't represent another country. He's supposed to represent ours. So he is charged technically under a different section, but it's all under the FARA umbrella, and it is just added on to his other corruption and bribery charges. And I'll just say candidly, with the first indictment before it was superseded, I was surprised there weren't FARA violations just based on the face of that first indictment. So that tells me that between indictment number one and indictment number two, probably the government shored up some evidence that they felt that made them feel just confident enough to bring this FARA charge. And maybe for whatever reason in the earlier indictment, they didn't quite think they had the evidence yet. Now, Danny, there has been so many calls for him to resign, including from 30 of his colleagues uh, on the Democratic side of the Senate. What would that mean for him in court? Would it be an admission of guilt if he resigned from the Senate? I mean, if you were his lawyer, would it make your job harder if he followed those calls, resigned and left office? Not at all. He could, and it really wouldn't compromise his case. But I guess as lawyers are part PR people, I would tell him, admit nothing, deny everything, continue on, and say you will be fully vindicated at the end of this trial. But not really. Statistically, he's 90-plus percent likely to either plead guilty or go to trial and be convicted. And looking at the strength of the government's case here, uh, at least one conviction is a high probability, just being in federal court to start with. And we've, you know, as you mentioned, FARA violations are very unusual. That statute is rarely invoked, but the sentences can be hefty based on past uh, examples of this. Uh, you know, a decade or more can be handed out for a FARA violation. How long could the senator go away for, and uh, what happens next here? Actually, no, you're looking at some other people on that list there that were charged with other things. You're right that in combination with other charges, uh, uh, Menendez's other charges are his biggest threat. FARA violations carry a statutory maximum of five years. And in fact, FARA mm -hmm. violations are so rarely brought, they don't even have a sentencing guidelines chapter assigned to them. So even if they assign, say, the fraud guidelines, your average fraud uh, guideline sentence is about 22 months. So FARA violations are really the least of Menendez's concerns, although they look horrible for a sitting senator. They certainly look horrible for uh, anything like a re-election campaign. That's right. NBC's Danny Savalos, thank you so much for being here. A manhunt continues tonight in Tennessee for the estranged son of Nashville's police chief, who is accused of shooting two officers in a nearby town. Police in Laverne are looking for 38-year-old John Drake Jr. His father, John Drake, is the chief for the Metro Nashville Police Department and confirmed in a statement that his son is the suspect in this shooting. Police say this happened outside a Dollar General on Saturday when officers Ashley Bullyjack and Gregory Kern were investigating reports of a stolen car and confronted the suspect. That's when John Drake Jr. allegedly pulled out a gun and shot them. Both officers are now recovering. NBC's Kathy Park is with us from Knoxville, Tennessee tonight. Kathy, what are you hearing about the state of the manhunt now? Well, Jake, John Dre Jr. is still on the run, and authorities are saying that he is armed and dangerous. They do not believe that he is in the Laverne area of Tennessee. That's where the shooting took place over the weekend. That's why they have issued a statewide alert. Right now, he is uh, wanted for two counts of uh, attempted first-degree murder. So officials are saying keep your eyes peeled. If you do happen to see him, please contact authorities right away. There is a reward that's being offered up to $2,500 for more information leading to an arrest. Jake? And, Kathy, I understand the father in this case is speaking out. What are we hearing from him? That's right, Jake. So the father happens to be the chief of police in Nashville. And shortly after this incident took place, he issued a statement saying that he's shocked and saddened that his estranged son is connected to this awful crime. Um, he also extended his thoughts and prayers to those officers who are now fortunately out of the hospital and recovering. But he also said he offered guidance. And despite his efforts uh, during his son's younger years, unfortunately, Drake Jr. chose a, a path to crime and he believes that his son should be held accountable for his actions. Jake? Kathy Park for us in Knoxville tonight. Kathy, thank you so much. 
Up next, some of the stories we are following around the world, including big changes from the Pentagon as threats grow against U.S. military in the Middle East. That is just ahead. Please stay tuned. Welcome back. Let's take a quick look around the world. In Iran, six-year-old Armita Garavand entered a subway car with her head uncovered earlier this month. She was carried off that train unconscious and rushed to the hospital. Now, state media in Iran reports that she is brain dead. A human rights group says Garavan suffered, quote, severe physical assault at the hands of government agents for violating the dress code. Iranian authorities are denying this. In Bangladesh, at least 15 people were killed and dozens of others were hurt after a cargo train collided with a passenger train outside the nation's capital. The number of dead is expected to climb. The cause of the accident is still unknown. In Pakistan today, former Prime Minister Imran Khan was indicted on charges of revealing state secrets after he was removed from office in 2022. He could face the death penalty for it. The trial is scheduled to begin on Friday. Khan has denied all charges. And finally, in Russia, imprisoned opposition leader Alexei Navalny skipped a court hearing today by refusing to leave his cell. He was forcibly removed from it by Russian officers. Navalny was protesting a decision by prison officials to take away his writing supplies. The hearing has been postponed to November 2nd. Tel Aviv's booming tech sector is supporting the Israeli military in their fight against Hamas in their own way. One tech startup has developed an app to help identify those killed, wounded, and missing. The software is helping not only the military, but hospitals and police as well. NBC's Jay Gray gives us a closer look at this new Israeli tech. In the echo of blast across Gaza, 40 miles from the border, where tanks and troops prepare to move in, there's a group of civilian fighters, their weapons, a mouse, keyboard, and computer screen. Their mission, information and identification. We have teams that are working on technology, cutting-edge technology like AI, like uh, facial recognition, voice recognition, trying to match patterns of movements and all the stuff. Tel Aviv's burgeoning tech sector using their special skills at a time when their country needs them the most. We worked day and night. Recognizing the agony of families unable to find loved ones after the October 7th attack, Reuven, a software developer for California-based Palo Alto Systems, says in just 24 hours he created the framework for an app now used by hospitals, police, and the Israeli army, pulling together pictures and data, helping to identify those killed or wounded. The authorities log inside and they put some filters on the data, like what is the gender, the eye color, the air color, the body type, does he have tattoos, what is his height. Victims unknown for days now identified in just minutes. Tech teams are also analyzing video, social media posts, searching for hostages and those responsible for the attacks. The industry has a presence on the front lines as well. At least 10% of tech workers, Army reservists, have been called from their office towers to active duty. It's like two completely different things, right? Because here I'm a, I'm a combat soldier. I need to, 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 to walk with, 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 with my gun. Stationed along the border with Lebanon, where firefights with Hezbollah fighters are intensifying, a few weeks ago, Shlomi was working as a software engineer at a Tel Aviv startup. Using a weapon or the web, there is a sense of urgency right now. There's so much work to be done. Um, it's not a time to take a breath and like uh, uh, think about the past. It's time to act. Action they hope will help to end the war so they can get back to their day jobs. Jay Gray, NBC News, Tel Aviv. NBC's Jay Gray, thank you so much. Now, a moment ago, I misspoke. Armita Garavand, who lies brain dead in Tehran tonight, is not six years old. She is 16 years old. My mistake. The Pentagon is moving even more resources to the Middle East. That is after an increasing number of attacks on U.S. forces there involved Iran. The list of military assets is getting longer with more carriers and squadrons newly deployed. NBC News's Courtney Cuby takes a closer look at the rising tensions brewing in the region. Tonight, with growing threats to the U.S. military in the Middle East, the Pentagon making significant moves, including reinforcing their air defenses, rerouting the USS Eisenhower carrier strike group to the waters off Iran, and telling more U.S. troops to be ready to deploy. 
after at least six attacks threatening U.S. troops in as many days in Iraq, Syria and the Red Sea. The U.S. blaming Iran and their proxy groups. We know that Iran is closely monitoring these events and in some cases actively facilitating these attacks. U.S. officials say troops would not go to war in Gaza and the goal is to deter a larger regional conflict. NBC News recently had an exclusive look at that deterrence. This is the HMS Prince of Wales. It's England's newest and biggest warship. But right now, we're out here to see how the British Navy and the U.S. Navy and U.S. Marine Corps are all working together. That includes U.S. Marine Corps Ospreys and F-35s that are practicing landing on the deck of this British carrier. U.S. sailors, U.S. Marines, Royal Navy sailors, Royal Marines have operated alongside each other for years. But right now, we're really focused on deterring any actor, whether it's Iran, whether it's one of the of non-state actors. And just today, the U.S. took down two drones targeting American troops at Al-Tanf in southern Syria. There were no casualties. Courtney Kuby, thank you. Before we go, it is time for the future of everything. The White House announced AI development across the country, and it could mean more jobs in a city near you. We'll explain. Tonight in the future of everything, the future of tech in the U.S. is going beyond hotspots like San Francisco and the Silicon Valley. The White House announced today it is designating 31 tech hubs across more than half the states and Puerto Rico, putting them in the running to compete for up to $75 million in grants. The White House says it's all part of an effort to develop tech companies in more areas across the country instead of being isolated to just a couple of major cities like this one. This includes industries in semiconductors, clean energy, medicine, biotech, and, of course, artificial intelligence. NBC News White House correspondent Ali Rafa has more on today's announcement. Yeah, Jake, President Biden appeared at the White House this afternoon with Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo to announce what he called these new regional technology hubs. And they're all in an effort to boost American competitiveness in the technology sector. He said that these hubs will be established in 32 states plus Puerto Rico, and they'll focus on a wide range of technological areas like in artificial intelligence, semiconductors, clean energy, medicine, biology biotechnology, just to name a few. And the president says that this is all being done in an effort to essentially spread the wealth, to not have these technological investments concentrated to the cities that we're familiar with, to, for example, San Francisco, Seattle, Austin, New York, Boston, to spread the wealth and have other communities in the United States be able to have some of those investments. Take a listen to a bit more of what he had to say today. For too long, we looked around the world to find, corporations looked around the world to find the cheapest employment and then imported the products they made, the foreign product. Now we're creating American jobs and exporting American products. The White House says that this whole project will cost $500 million, and that money is coming from the Chips and Science Act that the president signed into law last year. And then the Commerce Department will then issue grants to the states that will be participating in this program. The president, during this event earlier, calling this work, quote, transformational, saying it's essential for American competitiveness in the technological field. Ali Rafa on the jobs and prospects of the future tonight. Ali, thank you so much. That does it for us tonight. It's a great pleasure to be with you. I'm Jake Ward. We'll see you tomorrow. But until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.